Chris Kelser here with Matt Howell. And on this episode of The First Run, Matt and I are going to discuss the latest Tom Hanks vehicle. <laughs> Greyhound. Hanks plays a destroyer cat. Well, I don't want to ruin Matt's thunder. I'll let, you t- I'll let him tell you what Greyhound's all about. And then we're going to discuss our latest film in our sci-fi marathon, Solaris. Another Tarkovsky film, Matt. Not quite as long, but we'll see how that one shakes out. And then we will continue our top 10 list of science fiction films by decade, this time focusing on 1990 through 1999. As always, we'll run down the big releases on physical media featuring your straight-to-DVD and streaming picks of the week as well. Really, it's going to be a lot of fun. But I'm going to do something different, Matt, this week. I'm going to try something different. I'm going to... Here, bear with me. I am. I think my problem is I'm always too tense, right? Because i got to run all the buttons. i got to do everything. Sure. So, sure. as you can probably hear me fade in and out here on my microphone. So, I'm going to sit back. i got my cup of tea. I'm going to put my legs up. I'm going to relax. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can do this relaxed. And uh, we'll that see. that looks that looks like the most uncomfortable relaxation I've ever seen. Well, because I had the idea. Now, as I'm doing it, I'm realizing my setup doesn't allow for me to do it. <laughs> so I'm gonna figure this out during this clip from Greyhound. Greyhound, Greyhound, Greyhound. This is Greyhound. We hunt you and your friends, Eagle, Dicky, and Harry. We watch your ship sinking into the deep. We hear the screams of your comrades as they die. How many of them will there be before you join them? The Grey Wolf is so very hungry. Your women will... Greyhound or all this goats. Switch TBS traffic to channel Zebra. That's a key. Nazis. I hate these guys. All right, Matt. So why don't you tell everybody what Greyhound is all about? And I'm still working on my... I'm not... This isn't working. I got to try another position. So you tell everybody what Greyhound's all about. Greyhound is about a convoy consisting of 37 Allied ships near the beginning of the war being escorted to um, Liverpool. The head destroyer in the task group of international uh, warships led by Tom Hanks uh, is called the Greyhound. And they get embroiled in the beginning, the openings of the Battle of the Atlantic as they are hunted by a wolf pack of five German U-boats. You know how they uh, came up with the term U-boat? Undavata? No. What happened was <laughs> the uh, Italians had the submarines, right? The U-boats. Okay. And the Germans were there visiting in Italy. They were showing the Germans the boats and the, and the Italians said, yeah. So which one's ours? And I go, that's a U-boat. <laughs> <laughs> I, that was that was a lot of setup for that punchline. Thank you, I appreciate it. That's a U-boat. That's a U-boat. So I am, well, I, I'm barely Italian. So Matt Greyhound <laughs> was originally right. supposed to get a theatrical release, but like everything, is bad. Apple bought it, and they're running it on their Apple Plus subscription service. Let me ask you: Does Greyhound suffer from being on the small screen? Or does the film actually work in some capacity being on that smaller screen as a home video release? What do you think? Um, yeah, I definitely think it suffers. I think, you know, if you had the ability to kind of see this on the big screen with the the kind of broad scope of the naval battles and, you know, everything that's going on, it'd obviously be much, much, probably much more interesting to watch um, on a movie screen. But I will say... Um, I read some reviews about this after I watched it and I, I, people don't particularly like it. I don't think. And I, I found it to be quite entertaining. I enjoyed it uh, quite a bit. So even though uh, it would be better in the cinema, I think it's still well worth your time watching it at home. Basically. I think we have another TNT classic on our hand. I think <laughs> this is just ACEs dad tainment, right? I mean, this really is built for, I think, middle-aged white guys, this film. Well, I mean, that's probably why I liked it. I'm I'm the dad of the two of us, so there you go. That's true. I have a dog. So I would say, too, Matt, that this thing, the first third of this movie is like a bolt of lightning. You know, I mean, it it, it basically jumps right out of the gate. 
and it works. It's exceptionally well done. The Also, I want to mention the sound design, particularly the score, the way that Blake Neely, who is the composer, is able to use music to relay kind of the action. And I love the themes for the German subs, you know, this kind of screeching howl type thing whenever they show up because the whole wolf pack thing, right? But I think all of it is really well done. And I think maybe it loses a little bit of steam at the end. I think that uh, it's even though it's a tight ninety minutes, I don't know. I just it, the it just kind of lost a little bit of steam for me at the end of the film. After that first third, it's just it's more of the same and, and more of the same. Now it's really well done, well constructed. It's a lean film, and it just kind of just moves forward all, all the time. But then it kind of peters out at the end, which is I think is is mostly just fine considering what I got for the bulk of the film ahead of time. I don't know what do you think? If you're here for like some kind of big climactic showdown, I think what Chris is saying is that doesn't really happen. It just kind of the threat ends and there's a, a brief denouement and then that's it. But I was okay with that. I mean, it seemed weirdly enough, I've been watching a lot of the old um well, old, the recent World War II stuff. Um, I watched Saving Private Ryan the other day. I watched Band of Brothers in the Pacific. And it all seemed to kind of, you know, that stuff was based off of true stories, or at least the two series were. And I guess it's really, I think that's what they were going for, um, especially with Tom mm-hmm. Hanks' involvement, since he was involved in all of those, basically, is that it's not meant to be, I don't think this is based on a true story, but it is based on a real event. And I don't think it's meant to be like kind of like this big dramatic thing. It's supposed to be, you know, you have these flurries of activities and there's all this drama in these kind of tight little moments and then it's just over. And then you don't really, what's next kind of thing. I think that's intentional. I know that's fair. I mean, it's not the Saving Private Ryan of submarine films, right? No. It doesn't have that big emotional payoff at the end. So, I mean, there's a release, but there's no big kind of moment, you know? Right, right. Uh, I think Hanks is quite good in this. I think it's a solid performance from him. He hits all the moments. I mean, Grace, basically, he's just a guy who desperately wants to have a meal. And just have no time to do so. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, or, or get some shoes that fit, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but it's still, like you said, it's well-constructed. It's a lean, tight film. Uh, it's tense. It's full of naval terms. So if you're into all that kind of stuff, I think you're actually really going to like this thing. It's really, it's an, it's a T, it's going to be heavy in the TNT rotation in about two years, two, three years. It's going to be like uh, every time I turn on Stars Encore, like Master and Commander's on every single time. Yeah. That's what we're going to get. That's what this is. Yeah. And listen, Master and Commander is a great movie. It's probably Russell Crowe's best performance. If you haven't seen, that's a film that I wish, you know, didn't really get a lot of love. That thing deserved mm. a sequel for sure. Mm. It's from. It's a book series, right? That that's yeah, it is. Of? It is, yeah. Are you not as big a fan of Master and Commander as I am? You I mean, I, I, I watched it and I remember really enjoying it when I saw it the first time. Um, again, but it's like... Uh, I don't know. I never really have like anything to be like, even when it's on, I'm like, sit down and watch it for a while. And I'm like, eh, you know, I don't think I'm going to finish this and I'll go move on to something else after watching it for a half hour. That's dumb. So um, (laughs) to answer my own question, uh, I think it may suffer from being on the small screen. I would like to have seen this like in a Dolby theater. I think the explosion, the way they shoot a lot of this, obviously a lot of the action takes place at night. So that you have Mm -hmm. these just bright orange and red explosions, right? And the, and the white flares, and then, as I said before, the sound design and all that stuff. I think this thing would have rocked a Dolby theater. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, I have to. Wa- I had to watch it at night. And when I do those such things, I have to wear headphones. So even though I have a kick-ass surround system and stuff with the uh, yeah. 4K and the Dolby Atmos and all that fun stuff, I yeah. can't really enjoy it full steam ahead. Right. I've right. decided for the rest of the year, I'm, I think I'm going to take at least one Monday off a month and really just enjoy the hell out of my sound system. There you go. Because I can't really do that in a typical day. Great. (laughs) Any final thoughts on Greyhound? I quite enjoyed it. I thought it was quite riveting. I was, you know, on the edge of my seat watching this thing Mm -hmm. several times. Um, Granted, after the fact, after I got done watching it, I realized that it's just a bunch of, uh, you know, navigation terms and, and stuff like that. That's basically all the dialogue. But in the moment, it didn't bother me at all, even though I knew what none of it meant. But you know what? I still had a really good time watching it. So I'm going to give this a, a B plus. Nice. Look at you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I agree. I agree mostly with you. It's There's nothing revelatory about this thing, but it is a solid submarine flick with uh, some good performances, particularly by, by Mr. Hanks. 
And uh, like Matt said, you get the submarine turns, you know, hard right flank or starboard or, you know, touchdown. It's, it's a lot of fun. If you're a middle-aged white guy like me, uh, I think you're really going to enjoy this film. So I'm giving Greyhound a B. I didn't give it a B plus, but I did give it a B. So That's okay. Worlds apart as always. I do. I think I was thinking that when you just said that, I think I've always been a little bit ahead of you. You have been. Or usually. higher, I guess. Usually, right? yeah. So it's funny that you actually went a little higher than I did this time. Mm-hmm. Good for you. Good for you. I still haven't figured out my seating situation. I may have to, I can't put my feet up. See, the problem is you're, you've moved your desk too close to the wall. That's really what it is. No, I can pull that off, I think. The, the issue I have is my little seat table on my right side, which I can push out. But no, I'm close to my printer. I, re- I rearranged my office, which is the problem. And also my microphone, where it's, it's, a, it's a problem. All right, I'm going to try again while we uh, listen to this clip from our big feature here for uh, our streaming picks, excuse me, our physical and media picks for this upcoming Tuesday. My wives, you all came to me broken, searching, hurt by a cruel world that is more filled with pain every day. I took every one of you in. I protected you. I sacrificed my life for you. I gave you shelter. I gave you daughters and sisterhood and life. So, Matt, that is a clip from The Other Lamb coming out from IFC Midnight. A girl born into an all-female cult led by a man in their compound begins to question his teachings and her own reality. Being released this upcoming Tuesday, July 28th. Sounds interesting. I'm a sucker for cult movies, so yeah. uh, we'll maybe have to throw that into the rotation and have that included in the hopper at some point. Also being released is An Accidental Studio, which charts the early years of handmade films, see through the eyes of the filmmakers, key personnel, and the man who started it all, former Beatle George Harrison. Includes a featurette, which is an exclusive premiere of the Q&A, which was filmed live featuring Terry Gillum, Michael Palin, Ray Cooper, and presented by Sanjeev Bashkar. New to Blu-ray, Code Red is giving a slave to the Cannibal Guide, starring Ursula Andres and Stacey Keach. A girl and her brother fly to New Guinea to look for a lost expedition led by her husband, which has vanished in the Great Jungle. Warner Archive is giving us Clara's Heart, the Whoopi Goldberg film. David Hart is a wealthy, spoiled Baltimore teen who is left in the care of a Jamaican-born domestic, Clara Mayfield. His mother, Leona, and father, Bill, vacation in the tropics after the death of their infant daughter, and they bring Clara home with them. David first resents Clara, but soon finds comfort in her arms after his parents eventually separate. Dora is Clara's old nemesis from Jamaica who urges a family to look into her past. Winter Archive is featuring a brand new master of that film. They're also releasing Million Dollar Mermaid with a new 4K restoration, as well as Pride and Prejudice, the 1940 version. This comes their new 4K restoration of the film from the best surviving film elements. An Oscar-nominated crime does not pay short, Eyes of the Navy, as well as a vintage cartoon, The Fishing Bear. Winter Archive is also releasing the Judy Garland Mickey Rooney film, Girl Crazy. Scream Factory is releasing 13 Ghosts in a brand new special edition featuring a new audio commentary with the director Steve Beck and then a bunch of new interviews with the cast and crew and some old uh, legacy features as well. Matt, 13 Ghosts. I remember not being really impressed with this thing when I first saw it. Right. What do you recall? I remember not liking it, but that's about all I can remember about it. Fair enough. Alleged... Or is it convicted in absentia? Rapist Roman Polanski? Well, his film The Tenet is being released by Scream Factory. A whole bunch of new features in this, including, which blows my mind, I'll get you if you want to release it. I guess you can move forward with that Scream Factory. But to conduct a brand new interview with Polanski nowadays just blows my mind. Right. I don't, I don't get it. And what else do we have here? Scream is also releasing Graveyard Shift. The Stephen King adaptation about the uh, folks working in the old textile mill that has a serious rat infestation, and then they discover a horrifying secret deep in the basement. Brand new filmmaking in King Country, working the night shift, two interviews with producer-director Ralph Singleton, and four more interviews as well with the cast and crew. Vinegar Syndrome is releasing Old Dracula. 
It's a spoof of the Transylvania legend. Count Dracula sinks his fangs into a bevy of playboy bunnies in order to find the right blood type to resurrect his dear departed wife. Then after a mix-up in the lab, he finds he has a different kind of, uh, problem. I, I don't know what that is. Brand new 2K restoration <laughs> of that one. And a uh, yeah, old uh, legacy interview with the cinematographer. Vincent, as we call it, Vinegar Syndrome, is also releasing Revenge of the Living Dead Girls, promoted as France's first gore film. Revenge of the Living Dead Girls, also known as... Okay, let's see if we can do this. La Revenge de Mortes Vivantes. That sounded more Spanish, didn't it? Flawless. Flawless. <laughs> it's a consummate <laughs> shocker of horror and sex that has grown into a legend as being one of the sickest and most perverse of zombie films. I may have to watch this. Uncut and remastered in high definition, as well as some older legacy features as well. Kino is releasing a slew of films, including The River, starring Mel Gibson, speaking of bad people, Sissy Spacek, and Scott Glenn. Lorenzo's Oil by Mad Max director George Miller, featuring Nick Nolte and Susan Sarandon. The Joe Pesci vehicle, The Public Eye, is being released by Kino as well. And then, Matt, finally, your lone big 4K release this week isn't really even a new release, but Best Buy is kicking out a brand new steelbook of Wonder Woman. Your straight-to-DVD pick of the week, I'm going with Nazi Undead. College sweethearts Brad and Ashley venture into the heartland of Germany. The romantic holiday takes a sinister turn when encountering a German SS officer, thrusting them into a psychological vortex revealing that there is not always life in a living space. Matt, what should we be streaming this week? So Chris hates it when I do this, but I'm going to recommend a... You binge a series um, instead of watching a film. Um, I've been catching up with Doom Patrol on HBO Max, and I'm having a really good time with it. Production values are good. It's pretty funny. Um, I'm not super familiar with the comic book, but from what I understand, they have lots of uh, little nods to some of the really ludicrous stuff um, that was in that comic, and I'm having a fun time with it. I'm about... 10 episodes in and intend on watching the rest of it as soon as I possibly can. I've heard it's quite good. It's supposed to be very bizarre and weird. It is. Like the comic. It wasn't Grant Morrison. Didn't he have a big famous run on that? Was it him? Um, I don't know if he did have, I don't, I don't know if he did do Patrol. I remember him doing animal man. I remember that. Yeah, there was, um, it's not Warren Ellis, but there was a, uh, famous art, you know, the run that, uh, a writer had on that that was you know made it what it is the weird kind of i guess it always was a little off right that yeah. was the whole thing yeah grant morrison originally conceived in the 60s but he uh, uh he took it over in the late 80s early and then into the mid 90s and made it kind of a more modern day property so i've been meaning to check that out i heard too even though it's not on hbo max is that the swamp thing series is supposed to be very good as well yeah, I heard that they're going to be releasing that on CW at some point. I hope so. I want to check yeah. that out. It's not available, I think, on anywhere but DC Universe, which I think they just announced that Stargirl, which I haven't seen, which was on CW mm. and DC Universe, is going to get a second season, but exclusive to CW. They're not going. To, I think DC Universe streaming thing is done. You think so? I yeah. think I just don't think any enough people are buying into it. So. They didn't do what I don't think they did what Marvel did with the Marvel Unlimited, right? Where you can get like pretty much no, all the didn't. comics for free. They didn't. If, if they the did pro- that, package. if they did that, that people I would have signed up for it. But as what I didn't. Have. Yeah, they didn't. Because um, Marvel Unlimited is such a good value. It's so much fun to sit there and just read just anything you could possibly want for the most part. Yeah, I had a free trial of it. I think for was like a three month window or something like that, and I mm-hmm. read a bunch of stuff that I never read, so I was really excited about it. Yeah, I don't know why DC won't that. I don't. Whatever. But I can't expect you know DC and Warner Brothers start making right smart decisions about their properties, right? <laughs> anyway, all right. Let's go ahead then, Matt. I, I gave up. I tried sitting back, but I can't sit back and relax too now because I have my I, my I have my eye problems where I can't really see anymore, and my voice right. cracks like I'm twelve. I, I so see. it's been a uh, it, it's a rough time. You're right a real now. mess. You're a real mess right now, Chris. <sighs> Worried about you. But I'm, I, I do it for the kids. All right. Let's keep rolling. Let's enjoy some uh, Russian talking about s- space stations and oceanic planets and weird stuff. They 
вот проблема. Человек потерял сон. Впрочем, прочти ты. Я несколько возбужден. Я знаю, сеньор, только одно. Когда я, когда я сплю, я не знаю ни страха, ни надежд, ни трудов, ни блаженства. Спасибо тому, кто изобрел сон. Это единые для всех монету, эти единые весы, равняющие пастуха и короля, дуралей и мудреца. Одним только плох крепкий сон. Ведь говорят, что он очень смахивает на смерть. Мэтт Соларис. So, a psychologist, Chris Kelvin, Matt, he is tasked with going to this, he's going to go on this interstellar journey to go to this space station that's orbiting this oceanic planet called Solaris. There used to be a bunch of people there, but now there's a skeleton crew, and there's something weird happening. So he's being dispatched to kind of check on all their mental states and see what's going on, right? He gets there, and there's nobody there to greet him. He kind of walks around for a bit, sees some weird things going on, and eventually meets up with the two surviving or remaining people there at the facility at the space station. Uh, but as things progress, all of a sudden, his dead wife shows up. And things kind of, you know, <laughs> get wacky from there. They don't get wacky. They get very deep and philosophical because we are, of course, talking about a Tarkovsky film, right? So, Matt, let me ask you, Solaris, was this another successful meditation about love and life and what it means to really just appreciate and love the people you're with and examine what you would do to relive kind of those possible lost moments or just another dull missive deserving to be shot in the space? It's always, uh, <laughs> as usual, it's somewhere <laughs> in the middle. Um, I think this, as I said last week when I was talking about our, our best uh, sci-fi films of the 70s, This is a much more humane film of Tarkovsky's. It is much more focused on the human condition. Um, and I think from what I had read that Tarkovsky wanted, that was a conscious decision on his part. He thought that, you know, Western sci-fi was way too focused on the technology of it and the aliens and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. not really about what it meant for people to be in these kinds of situations. So I think on some level or on many levels, it's very successful at that point. I think what I had forgotten, because I hadn't seen this movie in a really long time, it still got that it takes a long time to get there. And I think there's a lot of kind of uh, shots that when I was younger, I thought were very artistic. Although now I'm older and jaded, I feel like it's artistic, but maybe on the borderline of pretentious. Like there's like the whole, you know, just for an example, the he's in the city of the future, which is Tokyo basically. And they mm -hmm. spend like three minutes just like showing traffic in Tokyo. For, yeah. well, like why, <laughs> you know, and like, it takes like an hour for him to even leave the planet, which is fine. It's a leisurely pace. Yeah. I think, uh, I definitely think it's something that deserves to be seen. Although I must say, I think stalker is better. Yeah. I I'm inclined to agree with you. I think it, this one didn't really grab me emotionally like stalker mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. It didn't have nor world on a wire, which I again I loved, even for all of its, you know, um, <laughs> issues, right? Its shortcomings, I guess, in a way. But uh, this one, I, I just it didn't, like you said, there's long span spanses or spanses, is that right? Long periods spans. where spans, spans. Yeah. Thank you, spanses. There's long spans <laughs> <laughs> when everything is kind of more filled with meaning, but nothing is really happening or going anywhere. Right. I did enjoy and I found interesting the times with Kelvin and his, I don't know what you would call it, not quite reincarnated bride, Hari. So what's happening is, right, is this alien planet is projecting these inner, what, wishes or dreams or, or mm -hmm. I'm not sure what you'd call it, just these thoughts that the people have and they present them in these people to them and his, happens to be his, his deceased wife. And he has to decide because what is what is he going to do? Does he accept the reality of what's happening, uh, and, and and potentially decide to spend the rest of his life with her? Though I do enjoy his first reaction when she shows up the first time, that he freaks out, gets terrified, and shoots her in the space. <laughs> But when she comes back again, he's a little more open to it, right? And trying to figure out what he's going to do. Once again, like you said, there's a lot more going on in this film than just 
your typical sci-fi genre stuff, right? It's not about, it's not uh, aliens teaching you a song a la Close Encounters. There's nothing that's taking the form of people and systematically slaughtering them to infiltrate the planet. Right. A lot of the thing, right? It's not so much focused on that stuff. It's more about answering certain questions about life. And like I said, how far are you willing to go to forever lock in the love and the life you lost through your own failings? And I found one of the more touching moments for the film for me is when we finally learn the fate of Hari, what happened to her and yeah. why she is deceased. And it's tragic. And Kelvin's he's well earned the torture that he's put himself through. And I think it's exceptionally illustrated. I think Tarkovsky does a wonderful job showing us that whole thing and how it kind of plays out slowly and gives us little bits of information as the film progresses. And it does draw you in, even I think as it's, it's a little slow at times, or as I like to say, deliberately paced. I still think it does a great job of, of drawing you into the narrative and to the film. It's, it's, I was under the impression that this thing was supposed to be more accessible than Stalker. I don't know if I find that to be the case because I think it's a little more distant and aloof than Stalker was. Yeah, I agree. So I, I don't know. But I will say that the ending knocked me out of my keister. I did not expect that. I did not see that coming at all. So uh, when it finally does happen and when the reveal is, is made, the curtain is pulled back. I was like, what, what, whoa. You know, I was actually l- legit like, holy cow, I did not see that coming. So I think that's part of Tarkovsky kind of luring you in slowly and casually before you actually realize what he's doing to you. So overall, Matt, I, I rather enjoyed Solaris. Again, I'm with you, I'm not as much as Stalker and not as much as Rolled on a Wire, but I'm still going to give Solaris a B plus. Yeah, I'm going to give it a B plus as well. I think revisiting it after all this time, I don't think it holds up quite as well for me. And I think you have to be in a certain mindset to kind of really get into and appreciate this thing. I think there are still the philosophical treaties, but I think the, um, the thing that really set Stalker apart for me was just the kind of the tension in it. Like it mm-hmm. certainly had more propulsion to it, whereas this is, uh, some would say, a, a quiet meditation. Others would say it's navel-gazing. <laughs> so it's really kind of what your, your opinion of it is. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I just want to say that I think we made a mistake. We uh, we front loaded these like three four hour films <laughs> all in the front. Yes. So I'm expecting my last these last two to really deliver on the fun because they're only nine minutes long. And I'm really sure that my one selection in Big Man Japan is going to be it. Yeah, not to, <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see. I hope you're right. And it occurs to me. I think I dropped the ball after Greyhound because I was so focused on getting my seat all comfortable and trying to have a nice leisurely conversation today. Mm-hmm. I didn't say, like I'm going to say now, if you've had a chance to see Solaris, shoot us an email at feedback at the first run dot com. Mm. I believe Solaris is currently available on the Criterion channel and you can get it as part of the Barnes and Noble 50% off sale on Criterion uh, releases as well. And same with Greyhound, which is available exclusively on Apple Plus. Shoot us an email on both of those. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Man. See what happens when I get relaxed? Things fall that apart. Out. It is. I need to be tense to and upset the whole time. I need yeah. to constantly be clenching my jaw. Okay, let's do this. I'm going to talk through clenched teeth for the rest of the film. <laughs> film. The rest of the show. 90s science fiction films, Matt. We're going to figure out... Well, we think we figured it out. We're going to reveal our five favorite science fiction films from 1990 to 1999. Here's one that didn't quite make the cut for me. How did I come to this? Not again. I played Richard III. Five curtain calls. There were five curtain calls. I was an actor once. Damn it, now look at me. Look at me! I can't go out there and I won't say that stupid line one more time. I can't. I won't. Well, Alex, at least you had a part. Okay? You had a character people loved. I mean, my TV Guide interview was six paragraphs about my boobs and how they fit into my suit. No one even bothered to ask me what I do on the show. You had the... Wait, wait, I'll think of it. I repeated the computer, Fred. Whew! Your commander is on deck. Ha ha! Wow, that smog is thick today, huh? Am I too late for Alexander's panic attack? Apparently not. So that, of course, is a clip from the fantastic satire i guess of science fiction films is that a way to mm-hmm. say it a galaxy I'll quest. Say it's a loving tribute <laughs> there you go 
So if you're not familiar with Galaxy Quest, it features Tim Allen, Sigourney Weaver, Alan Rickman, Tony Shalhoub, Sam Rockwell. I mean, this thing is stacked, Matt. And it basically, it's like the Star Trek crew, right? They made a TV show called Galaxy Quest. But what happens is a bunch of aliens actually think they're real people, like real heroes. So they kidnap them to help them fight off their own enemies in space. And it is a lot of fun. It is very funny. If you haven't seen Galaxy Quest, I would highly recommend it. I'm assuming you're a fan of the Galaxy Quest. Yeah, I really, I really, really enjoy the Galaxy Quest. I think it is a an underrated gem for sure. So there you go. All right, so I'll start things off, Matt. My number five. I go back and forth on this, right? I've had two movies in this slot, and I've gone one or the other all the last couple of days. I'm trying to decide which one to go with. In the end, I think I'm going to choose the one that's more timely. What? Except no, it's not. God damn it. Because <laughs> both of them are very timely right now. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to say, I'm just going to go with the one that I is more fun, which is Paul Verhoeven's Starship Troopers. Okay. All right. So what happens is a bunch of bugs are hurtling themselves through the galaxy and the little asteroids hit Earth, right? And then a bunch of them come out and everybody's got to stop them. So we're going to go ahead and go to their planet and try and wipe them out once and for all. But really what this is, is Paul Verhoeven is making an anti-war, specifically an anti-fascism film. And it is a satire basically on the Nazi fascist propaganda films from World War II and pre-World II, pre-World War II area. It is a blast. It is hyper-violent. It is ridiculously dumb but at the same time, brilliant and fun and hilarious. So there's a point where Neil Patrick Harris basically shows up in an SS uniform. It's like if Verhoeven's like, if you don't get it yet, I'm going to show Doogie Howser here in an SS uniform, all right? Just, we can really hammer this point home. So it is just, I say, what exceptionally timely right now. I won't mention my other one in case it shows up on your list, but if it hits yours, I will say that was my other one, Matt. Then we'll okay. talk about it then. But... All right. Number five is the, dare I say, classic Starship Troopers. All right. My number five, um, this was a tough one because there were a good four films jockeying for this position, Galaxy Quest being one. Hmm. But I went with the only time any of these are going to appear on any of my lists. Uh, I went with Star Trek VI, the, what is it, the, the Final Frontier? The or Undiscovered, the Undiscovered Country. Undiscovered Country, excuse me, yes. I actually... As much as I love Wrath of Khan, and I think it's the best you know, Star Trek film, this is the most Trek of the Trek films, where it seems, you know, there's the Klingons, and it's really, you know, a diplomatic incident that's going to lead to war and all this kind of stuff. So it seems like it's a very, like, fitting last raw for the crew. And I think it clicks on all cylinders, unlike really many of the other ones. I think it's it's absolutely fantastic. So I had to give my beloved Star Trek some love. So that was my number five pick. Nice. It's my number four, actually. Okay. But it is my the second best film in the series for me. I agree with you. It is a lot of fun. Again, Nicholas Meyer returns to the director's chair after directing, the, of course, the classic Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And this one is a blast. Right? It has political intrigue as well as some pretty good ship fights, some ship battles, right? Which is always a big, I think, a hallmark of what make the best films. And... It is just a lot of fun. You have Christopher Plummer chewing up scenery, perhaps even more so than Montalban does in Khan. And really, all the classic moments are there, and it is a lot of fun. It's like a big, fun roller coaster ride of uh, Star Trek. So, yeah. There you go. Undiscovered Country is my number four. <laughs> all right. So, my number four is um, Terry and Gilliam's my- Time Travel Minds F uh, 12 Monkeys. Mm-hmm. Um, basically a film about dystopian future post-apocalyptic where a mysterious disease has basically wiped out the human population. Everybody's forced to live underground. A group of scientists sends an unwilling prisoner and Bruce Willis back in time to see if he can find out some information in order to maybe develop a vaccine and, you know, make the world a better place. He, it's got all the kinds of time paradoxes. It really has a lot of interesting things to say about predestination how you can't change your fate. And it's got some performances in it. Bruce Willis is great. Brad Pitt does a turn as a uh, mental patient. It's It's got a lot of the Terry Gilliam hallmarks, and it's, uh, it's a very 
slice of 90s that's worth watching. That was the film. I went back okay. and forth with Starship Troopers. It was 12 months. Okay. Okay. I could really go either way. If you ask me tomorrow, I may say 12 Monkeys. And didn't Pitt win an Academy Award for that performance? Oh, he was just nominated. Uh, no, he, he, he was nominated. Yeah. He lost to Spacey in The Usual Suspects. Okay. So there you go. Boy, bad call there, huh? All right. My number three, then, is my second and final Paul Verhoeven film on this list. There is okay. no way that Total Recall was not going to hit my list here. You got uh, vintage Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think this is actually kind of to the tail end, though, right? I think started started to take a, uh, a downhill turn uh, after Total Recall. But still, it is a lot of fun. Schwarzenegger plays. It's, it's the adaptation of the Philip K. Dick uh, novel. Is it also Total Recall? In the actual? You would probably know better than I would. Uh, it's not Total Recall. I forget what it's called, though. Oh, we can remember. We can sell it to you wholesale, or we can remember it. We can for remember you it for you wholesale. Thank yeah. you. That's it. Okay. And uh, I haven't watched the other adaptation of the source material with Colin Farrell mm-hmm. and Kate Beckinsale. I think since oh, I it have. came out, mm-hmm. I've been wanting to, I think, revisit it. But I don't know if that would be a wise decision. Well, you never see. I haven't watched the uh, the old Arnie Total Recall recently. No, I haven't watched that in a while. I actually bought it as part of the iTunes five dollar Arnold Schwarzenegger sale a while back, but I haven't plugged it in yet. But I'm talking about the Farrell Beckinsale one. Oh, either. I haven't seen oh, that yeah. very since it came out, and I've been wondering yeah. if I should revisit. Oh, okay. Um, I remember. Yeah, you can probably skip that one. It's not so good. <laughs> Fair enough. So Schwarzenegger plays a guy, right? He's he's haunted by these dreams that he was something else, something more. And he goes to the uh, recall place to have a vacation, right? Where they implant the actual memory of the vacation so you don't have to go on said vacation. Right. But what it does is it actually breaks some kind of thing in his brain where they had, had, had repressed his memories where he actually was a secret agent. And now the bad guys are coming to get him to stop him from remembering and to stop him from, stop, stop him from freeing the people on mars and this whole thing except maybe at the end where maybe the whole thing is a big brain implant anyway and it didn't really happen right maybe maybe wink right. wink maybe me so it's famous it's got a lot of famous stuff you have the little stomach guy right right and you have uh you have of course the three-breasted woman which was a big big thing back in the day mm-hmm. yeah but uh and then the woman who the uh that schwarzenegger's wearing the mask of that goes a little yeah. loopy after the and they remember how cutting edge that x-ray technology animated se- se- technology was at the time oh yeah. oh yeah yeah that was like a huge deal at the time so then this is 1990 so right. it was a lot of crazy stuff in this film and it's still a blast. I, I did rewatch it, I think about three years ago and I still had a lot of fun. I think Ronnie Cox is great in it, you know, Sharon Stone. So anyway, total recall. Yeah, there you go. I'm done babbling. Number three. <laughs> All right. Um, my number three is uh, an animated film that we've talked about many times on the show and I mm-hmm. absolutely adore it. It's the iron giant, the Ben Diesel's best role where basically uh, Hogarth, a young boy in Maine in the 50s during the height of the Cold War and the Red Scare, Sputnik's just been uh, launched into orbit and, you know, America's on high alert when something crashes in the woods and it turns out to be a massive iron extraterrestrial robot that he befriends. And it turns out this thing is like a child. It has very little um, malice or understanding in it but of course people don't understand what it is and they chase after it where it turns out maybe maybe he is a weapon who knows it's a really heart-touching little film it was criminally underappreciated when it came out but it's it's really an all-time classic i just love the designs of it a lot of the throwback 50s science fiction stuff it's it's a great little film that you can watch with the family there you go oh yeah this is brad bird's big big release too right this is his first mm-hmm. film or at least the thing that really broke him that made him yeah i think so uh, a name to be watched i love iron giant when i first started putting my list together it was in my top five but eventually unfortunately got squeezed out so iron giant is great number two then is i wanted to come up with something clever to say here but i really got nothing so the wachowski sisters matrix right the thing that <clears throat> redefined cinema at the time would gave us bullet time and gave Kahanu a whole more, a whole new role, a whole other franchise to deal with. Though I still think I prefer John Wick over the Matrix series so far. I mean, I think they're just much better films. Yeah, I, I would agree. But the first film 
the matrix is just peak 90s science fiction action unfortunately it is so good that it spawned a lot of bad imitators i know there's a lot of love out there for equilibrium which i don't get i have i remember watching when it came out and being yeah. saying this is basically it's like when pulp fiction came out right and all the kind of copycats came out and but maybe i have to rewatch that i don't know either way it set the pace it is a so so influential into the science fiction and and action genres to this day, even though I think at this point it's become a little cliched now with the long leather dusters, right, and the sunglasses and the unlimited bullets, the the bullet time and all that stuff. Though we're getting a new Matrix film, so we'll see. But still, it it needs its due, Matt. We had to give it its props. And I think I'm assuming it may come up for you too, but it's my number two Matrix. Yeah, I mean, it was always the Matrix. I can't overstate how much of a, a splash the Matrix was because, like, the marketing was brilliant. They didn't even tell you what it was. I think the tagline was that there was just a bunch of flashes of, of just unrelated scenes. And you didn't really know what the hell you were getting, mm-hmm. and it just had that voiceover from Lawrence Fishburne saying, "You know, no one can tell you what the Matrix is. You just have to experience it for yourself." Which is such. It's like obviously written in there just to be the marketing slogan for this thing, um, but it worked, man. And I just remember all those frat bros were just blown away. They had never ever considered like, what if life is a simulation kind of thing, and they just like had existential crises about <laughs> that, you know. <laughs> of course, unfortunately, it gave us the whole red pill stuff, which is that's very really true. Matter. It did, uh, it did. That's not the Matrix's fault, right? And the irony true. is is delicious as far as that. Goes. That's very true. That's. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true that the the movement grabbed onto this film and, and that specific part of it, not realizing that this whole film basically is an allegory for trans acceptance and then coming right. out as, you know, yeah, interesting. All right, yeah. go ahead. All right, so my number two is Chris's number five, which I'm shocked at. I don't mm. know if maybe I'm too high, but I think he's too low. Um, mine is, uh, my number two is Starship Troopers, a just a beautiful satire and i love the fact that at the time nobody got it they just thought it was a dumb action film and they just thought it, the acting was terrible which it is and the best part about the acting is that all of the actors are so dumb none of them are on it so they're they're not even in on it <laughs> you know? like except for neil patrick eric's he's the only one who gets it in the whole damn thing and that's even causes it to sell it even more but as even as chris said i mean it's really just about you know, what if the Nazis had won the war or some kind of fascist state had taken over sometime in Earth's history? Because, come on, they are all supposed to be from Brazil, but they're all white and blonde and blue eyed, you know? Mm-hmm. So like, you know, just like the boys from Brazil kind of thing. Honestly, just the just the the critique and the satire is just so spot on. And you know what? The ultra violence in the, in the action scenes are just also just icing on the cake. It is so much fun. I love uh, Starship Troopers, right up there with uh, RoboCop. One, two punch. You should watch those back to back, my friends. Oh, yeah. No, that, that'd be a great idea. All right, Matt. So my number one, I went back and forth on, on this list because it is more, I think, known and appreciated as the greatest action film of the 90s and possibly one of the greatest sequels ever made. But the science fiction elements of it are so strong that I think it's it's not incidental. Like, like there's a reason Jurassic Park isn't on my list, right? That's an adventure film that has some, like, a dusting of science fiction in it, right? This film, though, leans heavily on science fiction, though it's action science fiction. Anyway, obviously, I'm talking about James Cameron's Terminator 2 Judgment Day. One of the most, if not the most influential film, uh, action film of the 90s. I know The Matrix is right there. It's like a 1-2 or a 1-A, 1-B type of thing, right? But still... Schwarzenegger, again, I know I said it Total Recall, but clearly at the absolute height of his powers, the best film he was ever involved with is this thing. And it is... Is it the greatest sequel ever? No, because you got Godfather 2, so I can't say that. But for action films, I think it's it's safe to say that this would be the greatest sequel, right? I'm sure... Shoot us an email. I'm sure I'm wrong about that. Uh, but I like, to, I like to dabble in hyperbole. It's my thing. So... Anyway, you have the T2, right? Arnold's back, but this time he's the good guy. I remember, too, in the beginning, you didn't really know that he was going to be the good guy or not in the film. Then you have the T-1000, you got liquid metal. And then, of course, Cameron again making a statement where this time out, 
the bad guy is represented by being the LA police, right? I right, mean, right. Again, heavy in the metaphors, but still. I mean, you want to talk about an action film that just pays off over and over again. It's Terminator 2. If it's not your number one, I will be shocked, Matt. What is your it's not my It's not my number one. Wow. Um, I mean, it didn't, it, even make your notice, list. it didn't even make my list. And here's, I mean, here's the thing. Matrix didn't make my list either. I think both what? of those films are, they're fantastic. And obviously I was there for when those films came out. And I cannot overstate how important those films were and how much they grabbed the consciousness of the country, you know, as far as pop culture goes. As much as I like the Terminator 2, I love Terminator 2. I prefer the original more. It's a little darker. This was much more sanitized, yeah. I think. And there are just aspects of it that didn't age well. Like Edward Furlong's performance, I'm sorry to say, does not hold up. It just gets more irritating every time he's on screen. And it just really annoys me. And it also just seems, as much as I enjoyed Dark Fate, it also just seems weird to watch it back where, you know, none of this really matters anymore, you know? So after yeah. watching that. So it's it's interesting. I, I still enjoy it, but my number one pick is a Dark Horse pick. It's Frank a film that I personally... Yes, that's it. Um, how did you know? <laughs> um, it's a film that I, I've always really enjoyed. It's Gattaca. It basically is the story um, stars Ethan Hawke, Jude Law, Uma Thurman, where it's a, a near future where essentially science has progressed to the point where you can design your babies, all of their traits, right? And really the amount of money you have to dump into it allows you to make a more successful individual. Their genes are better. And it creates basically the freeborn society of people who are born naturally and at random. They're basically third-class citizens. And really, it's the story of how Ethan Hawke, who has a congenital heart defect, is prevented from kind of being in the space program. And he essentially goes undercover, pretending to be Jude Law, um, and goes through this entire process while his own brother um, is searching him down. There's just something about Gattaca that just speaks to me. It's, guys, let me tell you, of all the stuff that we have on here, it's maybe far future stuff. Um, if it's ever going to happen, this is going to happen. They can already, they're already talking about how they're, they've got genetic splicers and CRISPR and stuff like that, where they can, they can design babies and, you know, eliminating hereditary diseases. That is fantastic. But you know that the rich are going to pay to have their kids be stronger and faster and smarter and better looking and taller and everybody else is just going to get left behind it's just a matter of when it's kind of a prescient slice of the of what is to come that's you know at the same time a really solid you know hard science fiction story i have never seen it it's so good i love it i've heard a few people over the years friends of mine too have raved about it but i never got around to checking it out so you should when you have all this free time yeah. When you're relaxing. <laughs> exactly. Get my feet up. All right. Honorable mentions, Matt. Yeah. So um, once we have admission, the faculty, Robert Rodriguez's yes. kind of ode to uh, the body snatchers, which I think we referenced that the story can be told well so many times. This is just another one. And it's it's fantastic. Let's see what else. Uh, Dark City, a uh, really mm -hmm. weird film. Uh, Contact, really good mm -hmm. hard science fiction film. Mars Attacks, a kind of throwback to kind of the 50s sci-fi horror films. And uh, what else? Event Horizon, a really good uh, haunted house in space. More of yeah. a horror movie than anything. And Fire in the Sky. The only reason I mentioned Fire in the Sky, it's because it's about alien abductions, but it's freaking scary. That shit is terrifying. Um, and it's it doesn't, it's not throwing encou close encounters where it's, you know, uh, they're all gentle and stuff. They like horrible, torturous experiments. There you Watch go. it be scared. Yeah, I've never seen Fire in the Sky either. It's not. It's it's Is interesting. Is Stevie Sweeney in that? I think so. Yeah. Is that the one where he plays yeah. the guy gets abducted? Yeah. Anyway, based on a true story. Cool. Air quotes. <laughs> Stuff you didn't mention that I would include, or it hasn't come up during our discussion. The Fifth Element, Luke Besson's film. Right. Uh, Demolition Man with Stallone. I think uh, a lot of fun. That one mm -hmm. when he, him, and Wesley Snipes. Yeah. What else we got here? Uh, I. I mentioned it jokingly, but I did include it as an honorable mention as Frank and Hooker. <laughs> Robocop 2. Of course, Vintage Van Damme with Time Cop. Stuart Gordon's Fortress, which is a great right. little B sci-fi horror film if you haven't yep. seen a Christopher Lambert. And then finally, I'm going to... Oh, Stargate 2. Did we say Stargate? I don't think we mentioned No, we did not say Stargate, yeah. And then I think uh, Guillermo del Toro's Mimic. Yeah. Which is... Uh, 
really interesting and fun. If you haven't seen it, you should check that out. So that's it, folks. Dems the lists. Mm-hmm. What are your favorite science fiction films from the 90s? Shoot us an email at feedback at thefirstrun.com. Coming up next week, Matt, what are we seeing? Is we're doing Big Man Japan or is it Time time, uh, uh, time, time Crimes? Time Crimes. Time Crimes. That's a, a DVD that I have owned for 15 years that I have right. never watched. 10 years, whenever it came out. I bought it back when I used to go to Blockbuster and search through the used bins. Yeah. And I said, oh, that looks interesting. I heard this is pretty good. Let me check that out. And then we'll also be, uh, what else are we going to be discussing? What's our big the, uh, next old week? guard. The old guard. Ah, yes. Ish. Currently available on Netflix. That'll be a fun show. And you know what else is funny too? The uh, Solaris was a blind buy. Every, at least annually at the Criterion sale of Barnes & Noble, I will blind buy a film. And one of them was Solaris about three years ago. And I never watched it until just now. So, hey, you have to let me know your blind buy this year, which is the uh, Come Russian see. War film. Yeah, I'm yeah. very curious to see how that is. Yeah, it's supposed to be very good. I'm looking forward to watching that. Uh, so that's it. That'll be the big show this week. I wanted to spend a moment, say just quickly, if you, I don't know if you follow it at all, but um, Michael Brooks passed away suddenly yesterday, mm-hmm. earlier while in the show post on Friday was a great political commentator. He was a member of the uh, uh, the Majority Report and had his own show, The Michael Brooks Show. And I was a big fan of his work. And brilliant guy who cared and just loved. And uh, it just I, it was so shocking because he was 37 years old, had a blood clot, and that's it. And it's just, it just shows you how fragile life is. So anyway, 2020 continues to be horrible. <laughs> anyway all right we're gonna go ahead take an extended break and uh, we will see you guys all soon take care of yourselves would you like to know more